"'Twas the night before presents when back at the house, Devin wrapped gifts for his kids and his spouse. He was distracted. His son took his phone Whoops. and clicked loads of phishing links all on his own. Uh-oh. What comes next? A virus or ID theft? Nah, Devin has Webroot Premium. He got worry-free rest. This holiday, get all-in-one device privacy and identity protection for all with Webroot Premium and Webroot Premium Family. Visit webroot.com slash holiday. This episode is brought to you by Klaviyo, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Klaviyo, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. A lot can happen in three years. Like a chatbot may be your new best friend. But what won't change? Needing health insurance. United Healthcare Tri-Term Medical Plans, underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, offer flexible, budget-friendly coverage that lasts nearly three years in some states. Learn more at uh1.com. I'm Jason Pack, and this is Disorder a podcast where we try to find some semblance of order in our mad, 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 mad world. In today's bonus episode, we're joined by our roving correspondent, David Patrick Harikos, who's literally just back from Ukraine and is joining me in my new house in North London that I've mostly moved into, even though all the renovations are not yet done. But David, it would have been great to host you here for Thanksgiving, but I believe you had to miss out as you're one of those sociopaths who would prefer to be trying to get into Shifa Hospital to check out the tunnels rather than eating my mom's famous pork sausage and sage stuffing recipe. But fortunately for everyone involved, I believe there were no El Al flights the previous Sabbath. Absolutely correct, Jason. I look forward to her pork sausage stuffing next time. Fantastic. This week, we're gonna try to draw on some of your recent adventures to tell our listeners about how changes in technology are affecting the battlefield dynamics in Ukraine and Gaza. And of course, this is the Disorder Podcast, so we wanna talk about how those dynamics are part of the global system and and the principles of the enduring disorder themselves, whereby weaker disordering powers are able to use technology to level the playing field against their more technologically advanced opponents. We'll also probe a bit the history of Gaza and the Israel-Palestine war to correct some misconceptions that we hear bandied about in the media. So let's get to it. David, when you arrived in Kiev last week, you were given a very warm welcome. Could you tell us about that? So yes, Jason, so I pulled into Kiev last week on the overnight train from Odessa to the news that Kiev was undergoing the greatest drone attack they had experienced throughout the entire war. Wave after wave of Iranian Shahid drones were attacking Kiev. It's important to understand as well that this winter is already so much colder and harsher than last winter. seems the Russians are really, really turning the screws up now on Ukraine. There's momentum behind them, they believe. And the attacks, especially on civilian infrastructure in winter, are discernibly getting harder and harder and harder. And what's the military logic of this? I mean, are they just trying to make the lives of regular Ukrainians suck and have grandmothers whose gas is out die of cold? Or does it have a military logic? I think the goal is to try and attack the civilian population, make their lives so miserable that they put political pressure on the Ukrainian government to come to a truce or a surrender or negotiations which actually I don't think is working. Everything I've seen every time this happens, it actually does make the Ukrainians more united. It increases the hatred for Russia and increases the determination to resist Russia with everything they have. And sadly, could we say that the Israeli strategy, which although not necessarily meant for collective punishment, imposes a lot of punishment on some Gazan civilians, doesn't break their spirit, but actually makes them more united? In terms of unity, I'm not sure, but I think that it certainly creates greater and greater hatred for Israel, sure. In terms of taking out Hamas, you are, as the cliche goes, probably creating more recruits to Hamas. The issue is, what is the alternative? And that's something that a lot of people are discussing. I'd like to talk more about the military strategic things because you're a war correspondent and you've been attacked on the front lines, both in Gaza and Ukraine by the same Shahid drones. 
I want to ask you, how do they get to the battlefields? What do they do? How do these drones shape the nature of the engagements that are happening on the front lines, both in Gaza and in Donbass? So to be clear, in Ukraine, they are Iranian Shahid drones. They've just been essentially passed from Iran to Russia because there is a growing alliance between the two. This is another geopolitical trend we need to consider, which is the, you know, this alliance of sanctioned states, this alliance of rogue states. In Israel, obviously, they're not actually Shahids, but they're the same thing repurposed. You know, it's the same technology that Hamas repurposes and gives its own name. So I found this you know, quite interesting to sort of be in southern Ukraine, eastern Ukraine, and Israel and be attacked by essentially the same equipment coming more or less from the same actor, who is not theoretically a player in either war, or certainly not an active combatant, but actually they are. And I think that says a lot about the constellation of forces now that are creating this disorder that we talk about, you know, here on this podcast. And one of the prime symptoms of this disorder is, of course, conflict. And you see that there are certain spoiler powers, you call them disordering powers, which I think is fair, that are seeking to sort of punch holes in what they perceive to be a Western-led status quo wherever they can. And actually, I think a corporal embodiment of this desire has come to be found in the Iranian Shahid. So beyond their totemic importance, what is the role that the Shahid drones are having in the Ukrainian battlefield first? Because we've been hearing a lot about how the spring and summer counteroffensive stalled and then the deep mining and the advantage of the defense for the Russians in Ukraine. Have drones been important in tipping the battlefield calculus towards the defense? Well, look, I mean, if we talk about drones beyond the Iranian Shahid drones, I remember being Bathmut, and this is something I wrote about. And I was with the Ukrainian special forces in Bathmut, and they took me to their sort of drone section in this bunker underground. And they said, you know, they showed me a drone, and this was a $3,000 Mavic drone that you can buy on the internet. And then they got out a projectile. I don't know if you've ever seen those cartoon rockets and cartoons that have three fins, Mm -hmm. like three Mm -hmm. fins on the ground. And so they said to me, look, we bought this drone off the internet for $3,000, and we 3D printed this projectile for $30. And we put an explosive in it. If we get it absolutely right, we can destroy a Russian T-92 tank. So when you think about the barriers to entry for this, $3,000, a 3D printer, stuff that you can get off the internet, that you can then use to take out a $6 million tank, you understand that certain calculus is a changing in warfare. This doesn't mean that you know superior armies are going to be completely destroyed but it does allow for greater defense or greater attack by traditionally weaker, quote-unquote, powers against traditionally, quote-unquote, stronger militaries. That is interesting. Let's talk more about other things outside of drones. I have a very unclear picture of the battlefield in Gaza. One, because I don't understand Israeli military objectives, and two, because I incorrectly thought that because the Israelis were falling into a 9-11 trap, they would be hit by more booby traps and guys who would come out of mines and would destroy their Merhava tanks, and that you'd have a lot more Israeli military casualties, like hundreds, if not thousands. So could you give us a little bit of a picture of what's happening in the battlefield, one, before the ceasefire, and then as the ceasefire has ended? And then maybe a contrast with what's happening in the Ukrainian winter battlefield. Yeah, I mean, look, Israel is losing soldiers. I don't think it was ever realistic they'd lose thousands or hundreds. I mean, they never have in Gaza before, even though this is more wide scale. But, you know, 50, 60, 70 soldiers for Israel is a big loss because these are some of the highest trained soldiers they have in many cases. But when we talk about Gaza or at least Hamas's military control of it, we're talking mainly about the tunnels. This is where many of the hostages are. And our spokesman has said, you know, our hostages are in the resistance tunnels. Gaza is a small landmass that is crisscrossed by hundreds of miles of subterranean tunnels. And these tunnels are not tunnels that you traditionally might imagine. You know, some of them are wide enough to fit a truck in a few, but they can get cars in, they have electricity, they have heating, their command and control centers there, their ammunition factories there. Obviously Hamas does not have an official army, so it doesn't have barracks, it doesn't have military facilities overground. So they're all underground in this subterranean sort of network of terror. So the Israelis are fighting in there. They have special units, the Diamond Unit, that go in there and try to take out the um, Hamas terrorists inside it and then try and seal them up afterwards. So let me jump in here. Clearly, destroying the tunnel network is a key war objective up there with the 
getting the hostages and destroying Hamas because you can't destroy Hamas if you haven't destroyed this tunnel network. Why is it just so difficult to destroy these tunnels? Can you not drop a bomb and then it just explodes the tunnel or can the Egyptians not close them off on their side? I mean, make a better fence that goes through the ground and blocks them? Oh, well, this is the interesting thing. Look, the Israelis spent, I think, a billion dollars on this subterranean barrier. On October the 7th, Hamas terrorists just used $30 bolt cutters to cut through the, the barbed wire fence above ground. They paraglided in. They used the sea. So Israel has done that. And what you hear a lot from people in Israel is that we got lazy. We thought tech would do everything. And, you know, we got caught short as a result. Look, in terms of the destruction of them, I think they're destroying a lot of them, but it's hard and arduous. You know, they seem to be fighting for every inch that they can. They have a lot of the Hamas tunnels are reportedly 50, 60 meters underground below the range of the bunker busting missiles that Israel has. So it is a slow, hard process. And is the Israeli decision to resume the fight after the seven day ceasefire and getting many female hostages, is this going to enable them to really get the tunnel network under control in North Gaza and South Gaza? I mean, what do you see happening? Will the war never be over until all the tunnels are destroyed? What's the subterranean end game? Well, if you speak to the IDF, then yes, that's the end goal, but I'm just not sure how feasible it is. Right. Israel has a window. And that window is the same issue as in Cast Lead and Protective Edge, like we talked about even before this war happened, did, yeah. which is that the very nature of these israel Gazan wars is Israel is on a tighter or looser leash. Mm-hmm. And when the Americans or Western public opinion pull on the leash, the operation has to end. Might it be different this time? Well, I think they got a bigger window because of the utter scale of the atrocities and depravities of October the 7th. But, you know, that fades into memory. I'm, it's, been, it's been fading into memory, to my mind, way too soon. Like if, obviously, if you watch Al Jazeera, it's almost never mentioned. But even in conventional media, other than CNN, who is maybe a little bit more pro-Israel than, say, MSNBC or the BBC... Yeah. You know, you get a narrative where the events of October 7th are quite divorced from what is happening now. Yes, October 7th fades from the memory. But it's not just that it fades from the memory. It's that every single day now you're getting more and more images from Gaza. Yes. uh, Of the destruction there. So it's a twofold process, both of which work on Israel. Look, Israel, I think, regardless of public opinion, will do what it feels it has to do to neuter the Hamas threat. But my fundamental point here is I do not believe that the objective that they told me to essentially wipe out Hamas or to render it incapable of governing Gaza to launch an attack like that again is realistic without them reoccupying it or handing it over to another authority. Correct. I think in military, like in sports, if you choose the right plan and then people are up for the moment, they can execute and win. But if you choose the wrong plan, no matter how good your quarterback or whatever is, you called the wrong play, you can't win from that position. And yeah. It seems to me that there's probably a lot of very bold fighters willing to sacrifice themselves and doing a good job tactically, but the wrong plan has been chosen and therefore it's unlikely to culminate in the outcome that they wish. So let's talk a little bit about the interplay of drones and rockets and Iron Dome. So we're not hearing so much about rockets. Obviously, there was a Hamas terrorist attack in Jerusalem where some Hamas sympathizing Arab Israelis or potentially Palestinians killed some Israeli civilians in Jerusalem, but there isn't much rockets that are getting in to Israel from Gaza and the West Bank. Is that because Iron Dome is functioning and not being overwhelmed or how's that playing out? So two points. First of all, at the beginning of the war, they were firing a lot of rockets. I was actually in Eshkelon, the southern Israeli town of Eshkelon near the Gaza border, and I saw this duel in, in the sky. I saw Hamas rockets fired and I saw Iron Dome come out of the night sky, streak across it and blow up a Hamas rocket. But um, look, I think that there's issues now when we talk about drones, this low barrier entry to tech that everyone can access because Iron Dome was created for rockets and it's been very effective. But it just doesn't work well on drones. Well, hold on, we don't know yet. That's the thing. It can take out drones, but it's meant for rockets and it's got a 90%. The IDF say it has a 90% success rate, which the Americans also say. We know that in the early days of the war, they were, it was facing hundreds and hundreds of Hamas rockets and it did seem to deal with them. But we don't yet know what it will look like facing a drone swarm, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drones, maybe possibly even more. So that as yet, we don't know. The Israelis now say they have a new system to deal with that, but that is as yet untested. And bear in mind, 
these drones, a few thousand dollars a pop, they can be sent over endlessly. Well, although they could be sent over endlessly, it's not like Gazans actually have the ability to get all of the technical components. They need to import those, just like all the medical kit and stuff they need to import. But with drones, you can just buy them off the internet. That's the point. They don't have to do Amazon it. doesn't deliver to Gaza when Gaza's under no, siege. No, but they do go to Egypt. And you don't need to buy them from Amazon. You can buy them in a store in Egypt. And then you can transfer them to Gaza. But wait a second, David. What can be done if not just the West, but also our Arab partners, our Sunni Arab partners like Egypt and Saudi and Qatar and Jordan are willing to work together to prevent Iranian tech and other drone components from from getting to Gaza? And how can we as a global system prevent the Iranians from getting their tech to Russia? Well, we can't in terms of Iran and Russia. Because, because they're two sovereign states and they have a border and they have a, an agreement. You know, yeah. They're both sanctioned. Russia doesn't abide by Western sanctions on Iran. Right. And but you can just Russia. drive them through Kazakhstan or fly them over Azerbaijan. Sure. However they do it, yeah. yeah. Okay, then what about Gaza? How can we prevent Iranian tech from getting to Gaza? Well, it's a good question. The answer is with great difficulty because we've been trying to do it. I mean, Israel's been trying to do it for 30 years, but they can't stop it. And I don't think the route is sanctions. I don't think you can sanction Iran anymore. And it's not as if Hamas has got a lot of great commercial links with people. So it's more about enforcement, I guess, is, you know, you, you really try and crack down on the transfer of that tech. But it's very, very hard. It's Iran's doctrine of forward defense means that it has a, a series of proxies across the region that it uses to battle its opponents and also to transfer a variety of military equipment, technology and other things to its various partners, one of whom is Hamas. So it's very, very difficult. One of the things I've learned through my Libya work is that when a state has been sanctioned many times and for an extended period of time, it becomes kind of sanction resistant mm. because Libya had the most comprehensive UN sanctions ever from 1992 to 1999, and that was as a result of Lockerbie. Yeah. But over the course of the 90s, the Libyan regime you know, created shell companies abroad. It created connections with various sub-Saharan African states that were not sanctionable. And then if sanctions were reimposed, they didn't work. Yeah. And that a lot of the networks for post qaddafi and corruption use those sanction resistant networks and you you essentially you can't sanction them out of existence because they are cayman island shell companies and they work in a certain way and what i feel like we're seeing in the iranian case is they've just been sanctioned to death you can't deter their behavior by sanctioning them more you know like you said the head of the al-quds force he's not going to go to washington for his vacation and hence putting him on a no travel list doesn't affect his behavior no it's like when they um put Sudikov on the uh, sanctions list and he couldn't travel to the US. He said, it makes no difference to my life. The only American things I'm interested in are Jackson Pollock and Tupac Shakur, both of which he could uh, access in Russia. Well, I would like to deny Surkov his Tupac Shakur. Are you a biggie man, Jason? Never heard of it. <laughs> and I confess, I wouldn't know a Tupac Shakur lyric if I heard one. The only reason that I like him is it sounds like he is also a pack. He is too pack. Oh, yeah. You're J-Pack and he's two pack. Exactly. Very good. Exactly. I hadn't thought of that, Jason. Yes. David, to sum up the use of drones and asymmetrical tactics in Gaza and the kind of deep defense that the superior numerical Russian military uses in Donbass, what might change things as we're looking forward to 2024? How do you see these two battlefields both evolving and interconnecting? Not with any great optimism, I have to say. The Israelis say recently that this war will be a long war and they will do what they have to do. So I think the Israeli tactic in Gaza is very, very clear. And they'll continue to do that until they feel they've achieved their objectives or as close to them as possible, or until the political pressure becomes too great. Russia and Ukraine is interesting. We're going into winter. Right now, everything is a bit wet and boggy. It's hard for the armored vehicles to move, but soon it will freeze over. Ukrainians are still waiting for a lot of the Western weapons, you know, the F-16s notably. But unless there are any great Ukrainian breakthroughs, I think this stalemate that the armed forces commander Zeluzny said himself will continue. And then even if not said publicly, people will start to talk about some kind of temporary ceasefire to try and move the situation forward or at least to calm it down. Oh, God. So then we're in the prospect of potentially both wars being halted by ceasefires from outside powers without anything decisive happening militarily? Well, it's a possibility. Right now, the Russians believe they have the momentum, so they're not going to look to a ceasefire, I think, unfortunately. I think what's going to happen in Ukraine over the next three to four months is going to be absolutely critical in terms of how long this war lasts, or at least the iteration of this war lasts. I think we're 
more or less at the position where the Russians cannot take any more territory from Ukraine and the Ukrainians cannot win back any more territory from the Russians, barring any surprises, which in an age where Donald Trump was president and Jeremy Corbyn almost prime minister is a big caveat because anything can happen. But barring that, I think that's the situation we're going to be in three to four months. And then I think everyone's going to reassess and see where we stand. After the break, we're going to hear more from David about what is misunderstood in the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict and in the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Simply Safe was named the best home security of 2023 by U.S. News and World Report. But we don't do what we do for the accolades. We do it to protect you and everything you love. Our advanced sensors and HD cameras are powered by 24-7 professional monitoring for fast emergency response. Visit simplysafe.com slash Spotify to get 50% off any new system today. Advanced home security, 24-7 professional monitoring for less than a dollar a day. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Landmark infrastructure legislation was passed in the last Congress. Now comes the work of getting it built. The Global X U.S. Infrastructure Development ETF, ticker PAVE, invests in dozens of companies helping shape the future of American infrastructure. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. Investments in infrastructure-related companies have greater exposure to the potential adverse economic, regulatory, political, and other changes affecting such entities. Before investing, carefully consider the fund's objectives, risks, charges, expenses, and more in the full or summary prospectus at GlobalXETFs.com. Read carefully. Distributed by SEI Investments Distribution Company. Hey, it's Ryan Reynolds, owner and user of Mint Mobile, with a special holiday message. If you sign up now for three months, you get three months free on every one of our plans, even unlimited. Now, I realize this is more of a holiday offer than it is a holiday message. But if you read between the lines, you can see a message in there. It says we love you. Visit mintmobile.com slash switch for the offer. Limited time, new customer offer. Activate within 45 days. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. Unlimited customers using more than 40 gigabytes per month will experience lower speeds. Video streams at 480p. See mintmobile.com for details. Okay, David, so the military picture is not looking that great in either the Ukrainian front or the Gazan front, but we also see them as connected, that the mere fact that things are going on in Gaza makes it more difficult for the Ukrainians to get the attention that they need globally, as well as the military supplies. So there's that interaction there. And then the more that the disorderers are winning, probably they're able to get more support. So let's zoom out and look at the history, how we got to here and and the importance of narrative and the enduring disorder in all of this. To your mind, why did these wars break out when they did? For me, it's because the enduring disorder itself is causative and that the West and specific societies like America and Israel were divided amongst themselves and the neo-populists were weakening America and Israel and the West from the inside. And therefore, because Trump was in bed with Putin and because Netanyahu made his judicial reforms and divided Israeli society and signaled a lot of weakness, this was able to happen now. Do you see it similarly? Why is this all happening now? So to answer your question, I think yes, with a caveat. It is quite clear that Putin, for example, was emboldened by disarray within the West. He saw us, what he perceived to be as flee from Afghanistan, the disaster of Iraq, and he assumed that he could roll into Ukraine without any pushback. He was wrong, but I think definitely he was emboldened because of that. I think the internal disorder in Israel certainly played a role, even though the IDF tells me it didn't. But I think actually the timing of the Hamas attack, even though it was planned for a long time, was to do with other things. I think the- The Israel-Saudi peace deal. I think the arc of history was bending away from the Palestinians. The Abraham Accords happened, not peace agreements, but normalization agreements, people forget this. They looked around, they saw a region making peace or at least- improving relations with Israel. As you say, they saw the cozying up between Saudi and Israel, Netanyahu and MBS in particular. And they saw that their cause was slipping from global headlines. And beyond the atrocity, beyond the horror of what they did, in that sense, it's been strategically very successful what they've done. Everyone's talking about Gaza again. Everyone's talking about the plight of the Palestinians. No one is talking about Saudi-Israel normalization. I think barring anything far, far worse, it will still happen but it's off the table for the moment. What do you think people most frequently misunderstand, don't get, have as a gap in terms of the history of Gaza, the history of Israel-Palestine, and how that relates to the current conflict? 
My answer to that, Jason, is how long have you got? I think this is one of the most mediatized and covered conflicts in history, and at the same time, one of the most misunderstood. I don't think people really understand the history of Gaza and Israel. I don't think they understood that Israel withdrew Ariel Sharon, the very controversial Israeli prime minister. He was obviously one of Israel's most famous generals, that he withdrew from Gaza in 2005, and that the scars of withdrawing from Gaza and then seeing so many rockets come out of Gaza into Israel on the Israeli population are something that people don't understand. The scars of this had a real, real effect on Israel's population. I think it radicalized them in certain ways. It allowed people like Netanyahu to come into power. You made a really, really important point here, which is that the rise of neo-populism in Israel, which is Netanyahu and the right-wing post-truth settlers, is predicated on the failure of the traditional right with its focus on security, right? So Ariel Sharon made this unilateral withdrawal, and he did so from a, I want to keep every Jew safe, we need to make sure to not have the 9,000 settlers in Gaza because they weren't keeping us safe and, and we need to pull back. And because that was seen to fail and didn't yield results, it led to a more extreme post-truth right wing. Just like you could say that George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq and then various other decisions were seen to not make America safe and therefore a post-truth neopopulist right rose. I think so. Look, the important thing about Ariel Sharon, I think, is that, you know, some people say only the right can raise taxes. If you're left wing, you can Correct. raise and, taxes. And only, only, um, Ariel Sharon could oh, and only, Gaza. and Begin could make peace with Egypt. Because he was, he, no one could ever call Aaron Sharon weak. And we talk about the tragedy upon tragedy in this conflict. You know, Aaron Sharon was not an especially pleasant man, but he was going to withdraw from the West Bank as well. This guy was a one, you know, a greater Israel guy's whole life until he realized it was untenable. He pulled out Gaza, he was going to pull out the West Bank to essentially set up that de facto Palestinian state, which he never believed in, but understood logically because he wasn't religious. He was a pragmatist in the end. But then he was, you know, essentially had a massive stroke right at the very time. And only Sharon could have pulled out those places. And I think had he been able to do that, had he lived, maybe the Palestinians would be somewhere closer to a state. Who knows? Correct. And if Rabin had lived, they really would be closer to a state because he was not only a great general, but he did come from a point of more compassion than Errol Sharon. Absolutely. And he combined that, shall you say, logical thinking that because this, this, and we, we, he was ready to give back almost all of the Golan and, yeah. and they would have gotten it over the line. Uh, he would have done. And, you know, we have to say, like, Rabin was shot. It's another tragedy. He was one of the people that really stirred up hatred against him in a very irresponsible way, in my opinion, was Benjamin Netanyahu. Oh, yes. Netanyahu promoted a lot of hate, not only among Palestinians for Jews and Israelis, but among Israelis for their own competent Absolutely. leaders. Absolutely. And who killed him in the end? Not a Palestinian. Yigal Amir. Yeah. It was, a, it was a religious duty to kill him. Yes. It's terribly, terribly sad. But so th that was an aspect of the Israeli history, which I think is not understood about the Hitnat Kut and the way in which the failure of trying to give Gazans their own de facto state didn't work. And it turned into what they say is an open air prison and what Israelis think is a essentially a terror training camp. But let's talk about something that's not understood about the history from the Palestinian side. What do you think people are misunderstanding about the Palestinian narrative and the way in which, you know, things are being portrayed fails to grasp their narrative? The Palestinians in Gaza have just suffered incredibly. I mean, this is another thing that I don't think people realize. Jess. In fact, I know they don't realize, which is until the 1967 war, Gaza belonged to Egypt. It was controlled by Egypt. You know, and the Egyptians never did anything to help the Palestinians or try to find a Palestinian state there, or indeed absorb those people into Egypt. Correct. So I think the Palestinians in Gaza have suffered twice over from the Egyptians and indeed from the Israelis. And obviously now, Sisi, the dictator of Egypt, despises Hamas almost more than Israel because they are Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood that was, you know, originated in Egypt with people like Said Qutub and so on and so forth was seen traditionally as great dangers to the Egyptian state. Correct. So you might argue that from Mubarak sides. forward, Ever since Anwar Sadat was killed for making peace with Israel, the Muslim Brotherhood has been the number one enemy of the Egyptian state. And Without therefore, a doubt. when Morsi got into power, all of the allies of the traditional Egyptian state and army from Saudi to the Emirates to a lot of Egyptian diaspora to the Egyptian Copts even rallied to get the Brotherhood out. And they see the Brotherhood and not Israel, but certainly just this kind of Brotherhood that Hamas represents as the paramount danger. I agree 100%. Let's look at two Egyptian leaders, 
Gamal Nasser and Anwar Sadat. Nasser, a great speaker, huge charisma, led Egypt to its greatest military disaster in modern history. He's revered. Who made peace with Israel, who got the whole of the Sinai back. The only Arab leader to ever get territory back from Israel was killed. He was the one who kicked the Russian advisors out, and he was a great statesman. He really was, and he was killed for his efforts. And that's yet one more tragedy in this litany of tragedy and atrocity and depravity. Oh, yeah. I mean, I obviously have a good cry about it once a week or more. And when in the I watch, dark. Yeah, I don't see the need to have lights. Why would I want to cry and see myself? Uh, um, Let's talk about history in Ukraine and its relationship to the Russian Empire and the Soviet system. Listeners may know about Khrushchev giving Crimea to the Ukrainians on the back of a napkin and Putin's view that Lenin was too soft with his policy of the nationalities that promoted a kind of Ukrainian-ness within the Soviet socialist yeah, he republics. despises Lenin. It's funny. But so what is misunderstood about Ukrainian history that with all your time that you've spent there, whether it's narratives or events that you think people should know more about? Sure. Well, I think when you talk about Khrushchev giving Crimea to Ukraine on a napkin, we must forget that Russia got territory. What exactly I forget back in return. Say so it wasn't a gift. It was actually an exchange. But I think about all this actually. It's something slightly different. It's something I've hit upon over 10 years of covering Ukraine, and one that critically I've tested with hundreds of Ukrainians now, because they're the ones that know. And it's simply this, which is Ukraine got independence from the USSR in 1991. It became an independent state, but it wasn't a nation. What Ukraine has been going through over the last 10 years is the birth of nation. Correct. 100%. And it has been forged in war. In many ways, this is its war of independence. Correct. Agreed. Before 2014, if you ask the man in the street, the woman in the street in Britain or America, What is a Ukraine? They probably wouldn't have been able to tell you half of them. Now, everyone in the world knows two things. What Ukraine is, and two, it doesn't want to be part of Russia. So I think that's really- And not only that, it's that Russian speakers in Eastern Ukraine who might have thought of themselves as, to some extent, Russian are almost all now made into Ukrainians. And the fissures between Catholic and Orthodox in the country are less salient than the fissures between Ukraine and Russia. I think so. I mean, yes, we're talking about in the places that have not been obviously occupied. I would say so. So I think that Israel was founded in 1948, this revitalization, refounding, or whatever you call it, of an ancient homeland. And in 80 years, Israel had to go through a process, the modern state of Israel, of self-fashioning. Now, nations are built around myths, right? And for myths, you need, you need a Napoleon, you need a Churchill, you, know, you need a Ben-Gurion. And I've seen Israel just go through this process of self-fashioning. And when I go there now and speak to people in Eshkelon and they talk about, oh, well, Golda Meir said, if we put down our guns, there'll be no Israel. If the Palestinians put down their guns, there'll be peace. All these things I hear over and over again. Ukraine, they're going through this process of self-fashioning. Yes. And things, national myths, figures are becoming important and you're watching it in real time. And I find that fascinating. Correct. And I'm proud of the Ukrainians for one, having the communication skills to fashion those myths. And two, for having the courage to fight for the myths once fashioned. I think that there's another interesting historical comparison between Israeli and Ukrainian identity and history. And this has to do with the way in which both of the conflicts tie into intergenerational trauma. There's the Holodomir in Ukraine, and that is the term for the deliberate starvation of Ukrainian peasants by Stalin. The word means terror famine, and that's very interesting because it has that sense of terror in it, the Holodomir. And then there's the way in which October 7th resembled a Holocaust, a mini Holocaust, or at least a pogrom, like an Eastern European style pogrom to many Israelis. So you've just been in Israel. Tell me about how you feel the vibe is about this historical moment. How's the population feeling? And then how are Ukrainians feeling? In Israel, the feeling that I really got a sense of was trauma. I was in the IDF screening of the uh, horrific footage of the 7th of October. I was there when they showed it for the first time and it was just traumatized. I mean, it wasn't just a screening. It was IDF people explaining what had happened and so on and so forth. And I think it was General Mickey Edelstein. And he took questions and one of the journalists said, like, how could this happen? Like such a failure of security. And he paused and he went, we failed. I've never seen an IDF general that will speak like that. Of course. So there's a feeling of great trauma as a result of that. And then rage, which obviously has an effect on things. The Ukrainians understand that this war is existential because there is no more Ukraine as they understand it if they lose. If Putin was 
had gone all the way to Kiev, hoisted the Russian flag over the Rada, or installed Medvedchuk or whatever is his puppet, Ukraine, as it is understood, would cease to exist. After the Russians were liberated from Busha, kicked out of Busha, and they saw the mass graves and the torches, they understand what the alternative is. So there is this belief that the fight is existential, but they're also very tired. You know, They're tired. They've lost a lot of people. I have a gallery of dead friends of an 80-year-old. If I look at all the conflicts I've covered and stuff, and that is very tiring. And for me, it's nothing. I'm not Ukrainian. I'm not Israeli or Palestinian. My suffering is minimal. These are the people that are suffering. But Ukraine, it's been 10 years. People forget. People think the war started last year. It didn't. You know, the war invasion started last year. I've, you know, they're people I know who I first met on the front nine years ago. This is weary. Winter is coming. Winter is hard. It's a hard struggle. You understand the reality of life when you get out into eastern Ukraine and to the Gaza border. And it's not pleasant. And I think it also ties into their psychological and historical traumas, going back to the famine, going back to the idea that the Ukrainian peasants were always put upon. There's always been death and trauma in that land, and they've been abandoned before, and they have a real fear of being abandoned by the West again. Look, that's a really good point. So I wrote this. I said, look, Israel is a country founded in trauma born in trauma, and trauma has existed throughout its history. I was in Kharkiv, or the Kharkiv region, and I spoke to this Ukrainian, and he said, look, if you are Ukrainian and born at any point in the last hundred years, you would have had to fight for your survival. And I thought about this, and he's absolutely right. So before we close with our last segment, what about getting Palestinians more agency? I know you haven't really been covering in your own journalism the Palestinian side, but how does the non-Hamas Palestinian population have more agency at this moment? It's a very good question. I think it's very difficult because they are trapped by Hamas, used as human shields by Hamas, offered up, as you said, as sacrifices by Hamas. And then over the border, Israel is striking their homeland because that's essentially where Hamas are, right? They have no military bases. They don't fight on battlefields. They hide amongst the population of Gaza. So giving them agency is really, really tough. I think, you know what, the only way to give them any form of agency is when all this is done to put in some kind of governing apparatus in Gaza that does not include Hamas, does not involve Israel reoccupying the place, and slowly trying to give them as much agency and improve things logistically, medicinally, and so on and so forth, to give them some kind of life again. It's the only thing I can think of. Correct. And I think that the international community owes it to them, and particularly their wealthier Arab neighbors, the oil states, owe it to them not just to fund some infrastructure rebuilding, but to really give them agency as an individual and a polity. I think so. And I think there is a lot of will actually amongst certain Gulf monarchies to do that. Let's order the disorder, David. Fantastic. So there's a lot of disorder out there. And it's not looking like things are going to be much better in 2024. The West doesn't really have any options to prevent Iranian or North Korean tech and missiles and artillery pieces from getting to Russia. And it sounds like it's nearly impossible to prevent Hamas from getting drones into Gaza. What can we do to minimize the ability of disrupting disorderers like Iran and North Korea from further destabilizing how these tragic situations are playing out in Gaza and Ukraine. We need to hold the line. We need to honor our commitments to states like Ukraine. Because otherwise, we will be seen as weak. Our enemies, those disordering powers, will think all they have to do is wait. We will get bored. We will flee. We have to be aware that there are powers. You call them disordering powers. I think that's fair. That are seeking to punch holes in what they perceive to be a Western-led status quo wherever they can. Yes, we can do certain granular things, tighten sanctions here and there, but there has to be overarchingly a consensus amongst the major Western powers that we will hold the line. We will not abandon our allies. We understand the importance of this because every time we fail to do that, we embolden the disorders. And I think there needs to be consensus. The only way to hold the line over a period of time is to have a Republican and Democratic or Tory and Labour or various EU countries and each other consensus on the topic because they can outweigh us because these are authoritarian regimes that their policy doesn't change every four or five years. And if ours is wildly divergent between one administration and the next, we're not going to be able to hold that line. I talk about this a lot, which is the gift of autocracy, right? The gift of dictatorship. 
you're in place, you don't, first of all, you don't need to worry about your own population. So you don't have to worry about doing things that are unpopular. Putin now is putting 20% of the Russian economy behind the war effort. Can you imagine trying to do that in Britain or America? Any government would be voted out immediately. And the second thing is you're around for a long time. Putin is essentially going to be around until he dies. You know, or loses. Or loses the war. Well, not an election because he's not losing any elections at that, you can be sure. So yeah, it's very, very hard. Getting that consensus is almost impossible because of the nature of democratic systems. But we still rather have them than live in Russia, China, Iran, or North Korea. So we need to hold the line. And I think one of the ways to hold the line is that the West should be planning for the day after in Gaza. And you and I have talked about my Arab condominium solution to administering post-war Gaza. What else can we do to plan for this day after the war? Because the war has to end and and the excesses of the Israeli punishment of Gazan civilians, it's not only not a good look, but it's not making the Middle East a safer place. How do we try to give them an off-ramp? The general principle of your condominium administration that are administering Gaza, you'd need to have, I think, some Gulf monarchies there, Arab states, certainly some international input. But we have to understand that you know international acts are not hugely trusted in Israel. Feels and they're even way. less trusted in Palestine. Yeah. I mean, I think so, but also there is question of sort of the capture of certain humanitarian organizations working in Gaza by Hamas and so on. I mean, the problem is there's so much mistrust here. So I think a coalition of international and local regional powers with some UN involvement might be a way forward. But unfortunately, there are so many obstacles against that that I simply don't know. But I think that loosely speaking, something like that, at least in principle, is the only way forward out of this, if there is indeed any way forward. And now let's pivot to the information war. With so much anti-Semitic and Islamophobic content online these days, how do we regulate that? How do we tamp it down on it and not let the fact that these ongoing wars just radicalize everyone? I don't think we can stop the radicalizing people because that's what this sort of footage tends to do. What we can do is get the tech companies to enforce their own rules. And if you see anti-Semitic and Islamophobic content, look, people should be allowed to be horrible. People can be assholes. It's not illegal to be an asshole. It's not illegal to lie. We don't want a world in which it's illegal to lie and so on and so forth. But things like anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, they're illegal. There are clear legal guidelines for that, and they shouldn't be on the platforms. The problem is it's not enforced properly. So it comes back to the age-old problem of trying to get the platforms to do what And does that require the US or UK government or the EU to simply put financial penalties against the platforms? Is there a way that regulators can use the power of the purse and taxation and penalties and lawsuits to make enforcement better? Possibly. What little leverage that governments have over the tech platforms comes down to that. But then you can't really seem to get these platforms to pay the tax that they should. So, you know, how are you going to get them to actually do what they say? And it depends on who, you know, the internet's become increasingly balkanized with different rules and different jurisdictions. But ultimately, it has to come from governments. Governments have Correct. several key powers, one of which is regulation. The only way to order the disorder is to regulate, and we need to be regulating our information space. So pivoting back to the military history, given what appears to be a stalemate at the Ukrainian front lines, if you could whisper in Zelensky's ear, let's say you were back in Kiev and you were able to speak to some military top brass there, what would you suggest? I've heard about this idea of doing an end around whereby the Ukrainian forces don't try to just run into this modern day Maginot line in Donbass, but try to like attack into Russia or through Belarus or, you know, do some kind of hook. What would be your strategic counsel? I would counsel against invading Russia because then a lot of the moral high ground that you have is lost. Huh? Uh, although I can see what you mean about going around and there is a de facto line. What we have essentially is a de facto DMZ right. by between North and South Korea right. and now in Eastern Europe. Strategy wise, I would tell Zelensky to keep holding out to keep holding the line, to keep putting the pressure in a polite and reasonable way on his American allies. So let's just close with some history. We've talked about how it weighs really heavily on Russians and Ukrainians, Jews and Palestinians. But history changes all the time, and even our perception of the past changes. How might we rewrite history or people's perceptions of it in ways that would make the Israeli-Palestinian conflict less intractable and that might provide an off-ramp, for example, for Russians and Ukrainians when Putin is dead? And, and how can we produce narratives that can be unifying and present alternative futures? Well, I don't think we can move past history and I don't think we should rewrite it. All we can do is understand it, learn from it, and from that, try to move forward. 
So the way to order the disorder is to understand history. You heard it first here from David Patrick Karakos, disorder's own roving correspondent. Well, that's it for this week. If you like hearing David's tales from the front lines or Alex's perspectives on Brexit or getting my thoughts on how to administer post-war Gaza, have we got a Christmas present for you. You can email us your questions at disordershow at gmail.com and we will answer them on our Christmas episode. But we do need your questions prior to December 12th. Next, if you want to make sure you never miss an episode of Disorder, especially when we release these bonus episodes, make sure to follow the show wherever you're listening. Follow the show on social media by searching Disorder Show. And for more on my reporting and my major articles in Unheard and the Daily Mail, visit our show notes. Our producer is George McDonough. Our executive producer is Neil Fern. For our next episode, we're joined by Kurt Volker, former American Special Envoy to Ukraine and U.S. Ambassadors in NATO. He will help us understand the role and importance of NATO in this conflict and others around the world. Until then, thanks for listening, and I hope you have an orderly week. Thank you.